All right, Unit 2, Old Testament. Now, I promise to share you guys some more stories um, about my life and my child. And let me go ahead and back this up real quick before we start. I like to take naps, or uh, if I can, and my son doesn't like to let me take naps. So if you haven't seen this, it was recent. My wife thought it was funny, but this is how he usually wakes me up. Um, some wrestling crazy stuff. So let's go ahead and watch it real fast. See, that's the problem. Don't you? I mean, he laughs at my pain. Oh, my. Guys, those who have kids, um, this is what you look forward to. Uh, those who have it, I mean, and those who had it, I guess those are memories that you can leave behind, right? Um, now, <laughs> that's a little bit about me. Again, continue to share your stories. Find me on Facebook. Find me on email. Some of you guys are starting to come out of your cocoon, and I appreciate that. And I definitely want you to know that I'd love to respond to you in any way or format I can. Uh, but I realize that I need to share first. Speaking of the prophets, boy, there's 17 of them. I'm going to do all of them in one day, one uh, session here. The prophets, or messengers of God, are very unique in the sense that I used to hate them. I mean, I used to never understood them. I never, under, you know, all this poetry, it was crazy, uh, prophetic, you know, it was like Yoda, right? Uh, the prophecy, uh, so he be, or you know, he talks all weird. It's all mumble jumble. But after I studied this for a little bit for myself, uh, I realized that you know what, they are pretty cool. You would think they're these old guys and little, little uh, cloaks and just walking around and like hermits. But man, I'm gonna tell you, prophets are like Jedi. They are action oriented. They are action. They're killing people. They're doing some crazy stuff. They're, they're, they're like. Literally, Jedi Master, if you ever watch Star Wars, it, they're like that. And I'll, I'll prove my point later. But they are a very unique group of people. Uh, and they are voice pieces or, or mouthpieces for God. So let me go ahead and uh, back it up a little bit, give you a context of what prophets were and what they're doing. What you are seeing in the Bible, if you have the table of contents, and you go ahead and flip your Bible to the table of contents, I've said many times, uh, they are not in chronological order. Um, they are written in... in based on the size of a scroll. And uh, so when you see in the Bible, it, it's just written that way. But I want to help you out. There is this thing that you can click on it. So right click on your PowerPoint. And I'm going to open this hyperlink. That the prophets, I went ahead and I remember when I was studying the Old Testament, I had to create a timeline that will be easy for all of us to read and see if it's here somewhere. It's loading. Huh. Oh, there it is. And this might help you uh, understand a little bit better. And I wrote this, and you, when you clicked on it, I wrote this chart for us. So this is the prophet of Yahweh, prophet of God, and these are the names. And I wrote it in chronological, all right? So the date of ministry, so when they lived and existed, who were they for? Is it pre? I mean, uh, during what time? Pre, post uh, Babylon, and and I'll talk about the exile, right? And who did they speak to? Because not they weren't all speaking to everybody. It was what country or what was the message directed towards. And, and at that time, maybe a context, who was the world power? Who was the dominant? Right now, U.S. is the world power. China's moving up. But who was the dominant nation? And then you know, some scriptural references. And as you see, there it's not written in the order of your Bible. Here is Obadiah, but Obadiah is what? Towards the end of the Old Testament. Hosea, uh, definitely, uh, you know, he was in here. So Amos and Hosea was in the north region, Israel. And as you read through it, the last prophet is Joel. Well, we haven't figured out where Joel is. Joel, we think, is one of the first books of the Bible, so that's why I have a question mark. But Malachi is the oldest prophet. Uh, I mean, I guess the new, right before, he was the last book written before Jesus Christ. And he was during the Persian time, and it was towards the south. And so, as you see it, this is the, it might help you. Now, I'm a picture person, and so I gave you another link. Go to my blog, and I wrote this for us so that, when you go to my blog, you just right click here, open hyperlink, 
and it should pop you up with this one and not that one this blog and on this blog I wrote uh, it might be more helpful in a picture format so I did this in a picture format where you know the, the same thing the, what there are three nations really that you're focusing on Assyria Babylon and Israel and the pre-exilic post-exilic uh, ex exile time in Babylon and exilic so you see the timeline between the two kingdoms that fell apart and there's Judah the south region that uh, that these prophets preached to and then restoration meaning when they came back home right to renew it and so again I give a little box chart right here but I found something else online that I thought was interesting and you can just pause here and use go to my website um, but I like this one instead this one again it's, I think it's a Prezi presentation but if you clicked on it and uh, I know that it's fallen off it actually has uh, a timeline King Saul King David and as we saw history and then these are the kings of the north and these are the kings of the south remember I told you there's two nations that split well these are the references of the Bible so if you were to write a table of contents if you want to do a chronological here's the chronology of it um, and if you keep going whoops I don't want to share that if you keep going you will see that as the kings ended you'll see Joel the prophet here so we, this is our question mark again Jonah, Amos, Hosea was during this time and then Isaiah, Micah all the way to Daniel and again we're trying to figure out where Joel is we're trying to figure out if he's here or if he's here but here are the prophets so maybe it would be good for you to kind of spend just a couple minutes to see what it is and there's four slides that I found but go to that and that should be helpful for you as you understand the prophet and, and the correlation of time and how it is in the Bible. So the Bible didn't write it sequentially, chronologically, okay? That's important. And as we move on to the next slide, when you study the prophets, the messages, even though they wrote from home, which is like in Israel, they wrote it to different nations. The message went to all over the Middle East. So here's the Mediterranean. Israel is sitting right here. Here's the Sinai, uh, Sinai Peninsula. Here's the Middle East, right? What we know of it. Here's the Mesopotamia, the Tigris and Euphrates. They kind of go along. Babylon's right here. Uh, current day, I want to say Iraq. And, uh, and you see these different nations. And so when you see these prophets, they were writing to those times. So Persia was Daniel. When he was a lion den, uh, Daniel in the lion den, he was in Persia. Um, and he was talking about Medi, the media country, coming up from here from the north. And the prophecies against Assyria, which was the dominant nation during that time, uh, these guys wrote about it. And then Daniel wrote about Rome and Greece. And so it, it gives you an idea that when you're reading it, it's not all about, hey, I'm, I'm living in L.A. and I'm writing about L.A. No. They're living in different parts of the world, in the Middle East, and they're writing to different nations and talking about it. And I'm going to tell you that there are really three messages they've talked about. And, and before we do that, I wanted to play a video. Right, video time. And uh, again, I'm going to be jumping around, but pretty much there are four videos I'm going to show in this segment. And I want to talk first about God's, mess God's messengers. And so let's go ahead and watch that. During the time that Israel was divided, God told a prophet named Elijah that there would be a drought in the land. He directed Elijah to leave the area and live by himself for three years near a ravine where he would have all the water he needed. One day, God told Elijah to go and confront King Ahab and his wife Jezebel about leading the Israelites to worship a false god named Baal. Elijah asked Ahab and all the people of Israel to meet him on the top of a mountain. Ahab brought 450 prophets of Baal with him. Elijah decided to conduct the challenge to prove that he followed the true God. Two bulls were brought to be sacrificed. The prophets of Baal laid down pieces of wood and put the bull on it, but did not set fire to it. Call on the name of your God, Elijah challenged, and I will call on mine. Whichever answers by fire, he is God. From early morning until noon, the prophets asked their God Baal to send fire, but nothing happened. Elijah taunted them, shout louder, perhaps your God is in deep thought or sleeping. So 
they shouted louder and cut themselves with their swords and spears. But still, nothing happened. He quickly built an altar using 12 stones, one to represent each tribe of Israel. Finally, he asked those around him to pour water all over the bowl and the wood. There was so much water flowing that it filled the trench around the altar. Then, Elijah called out, Let it be known today that you are God in Israel. And fire fell from the sky and burned up the bowl, the wood, and even the stones and soil. When the people saw this, they fell to their faces and yelled, The Lord, he is God. The prophets of Baal were then arrested and killed in the valley below the mountain. When King Ahab returned home and told his wife Jezebel what happened, she was furious and sent word to Elijah that she was going to have him killed. So Elijah fled to the wilderness. There he met an angel sent by God to take care of him, who gave him food and water. Eventually, God told Elijah, that Elisha would take his place as a prophet in Israel. Not long after, Elijah and Elisha were walking along the road and a chariot and horses made of fire appeared out of nowhere and took Elijah up into the sky. So Elisha continued to do God's work, performing miracles and at one point even raising a young boy from the dead. Elijah stretched out his body over the boy and caused him to sneeze seven times, bringing him back to life. For many years after, God continued to use Elijah and a number of other prophets to perform miracles and warn the Israelites of all that would happen to them if they did not follow God. Despite the prophets' warning, the next several kings led Israel further and further from God. It was only a matter of time before things had to change. And that is the uh, story of the messengers, God's messengers. And, and if you notice that he was drawing all these different prophets, throughout these kings, the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, they split after Solomon uh, had a son, Rehoboam, and we talked about they had a split. Well, prophets, God would keep sending messengers. And these messengers um, would have three types of messages. Either repent, you've done something wrong, repent, turn away and turn towards. Number two, uh, they would either have a message of, of uh, warning. Hey, we're warning you, please, but don't do this again. Or a third one is judgment, just straight up, hey, you know what, it's, it's, it's punishment time. And so as you will see, these messages go back and forth. And again, the whole story is God is trying to intervene. He's sending these people. They're not just people who can tell the future. They're people that can do, um, when I say miracles, have signs that they represent God through healing, through casting things on fire. That was a, that was a Jedi scene, by the way. I'll, I'll share a little more about Elijah and, and slashing the prophets. But you see that God is trying to intervene, but they still don't get it. He keeps sending his word of God, and eventually he's going to send the final prophet. But this time, its prophet is his son. And his son will have the message and the final message. And he's going to do all three. He's going to talk about warning, repentance, and judgment. And that's the message of Jesus Christ. And that will be in our next section. All right. So then we are breaking them down to major prophets. If I get my slide working. Oh, one second. I'm lagging. Okay. Time to upgrade computer. So the major prophets. Major prophets in your Bible is uh, starts right after the wisdom literature. Go to your New Testament. You have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Um, I wanted to share you uh, highlights of them. Isaiah is the first one. Isaiah is from the south. He is one of the most eloquent uh, speakers out there. And um, if you get a chance when you zoom through it, this is an outline of the chapter. But I want to go quickly to the key word. It's salvation. Isaiah is about salvation. And um, his name is salvation is of the Lord. And we know the key verses. And this is probably one of the most quoted texts in the New Testament. And so we know Isaiah is something that uh, Jesus talks about. And this is what you always hear during Christmas. So the key verse 
He is talking about salvation through a Savior, a Messiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We're talking about this is hundreds of years before Christ. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end upon the throne of David over his kingdom to order it and establish it judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord hosts will perform this. And so you know this is talking about Jesus Christ. And, it, and, and this is the key verse. And then the 53, 6 is, all we, have, uh, all we are like sheep have gone astray and we have turned and everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of all, us all. Meaning, we have gone astray, we need to repent. And if you notice, these are themes of Israel, the nation of Israel. And the Lord has laid him the iniquity, and he's taken the sin for us. And so, here is the key verse. It's about salvation, and, and we talk about uh, so many key chapters there. Isaiah 53 talks about the cross, of how you know uh, he was whipped, and so it's a prophecy of the cross, of how Jesus suffered and died for us. And so, you see all this happening in Isaiah, and, and I, I hate to do it disservice by giving you only 30 seconds of it, but that is the key term, Isaiah. And Jeremiah was his contemporary. So Jeremiah was uh, the one that I like to think is almost Jedi-ish, and I have some stories to share with you on that. But here Jeremiah is considered the weeping prophet. You know why he was weeping? He was he, During his ministry, he never had a chance to, re, uh, I guess, share the gospel with people conversion. He didn't have many followers. In fact, he was very he was hated. But he was one of the most eloquent speakers of the Bible. And I want to ask you to open your Bibles to Jeremiah. And people will ask me oftentimes, you know, hey, what do you think about abortion and pro-life and pro-choice? Well, here is something that is good to hang your hat on. And this is in chapter 1, verses 4. And this is it talks about how Jesus, oh, God is calling Jeremiah to become a prophet during that time. And so here is a most commonly quoted passage in Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you, in the womb I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. And I think that's the encouragement here, is that God has created all of us. I believe that. And he, has, he knew us before we were conceived, and he knew every life. It says in the Bible, every hair on our head, he, he knows the count. And so in Jeremiah, we see this outline, um, the warning, or the coming judgment, <laughs> um, to the nation of Israel. They, they've been pretty bad at this point in time. And, and I want you to know the key verse here is, it's, it's, it's kind of like the last hour, and you could read it for yourself, but um, there is judgment coming. In fact, Jeremiah has written, um, I want to sum it up in Jeremiah, I want to say 18. Let's go and look it up real quick. Jeremiah was a fool prophet. I'm sorry, you guys aren't talking to me, so I'm just going to get it out here. Nope, Jeremiah 28. Let's see, Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 28, I wanted to read to you about the false prophet. It was a crazy battle scene. Now, you saw Elijah. He battled off 400 prophets, and he was basically in a contest. But there is a. How do you know what a false prophet is? And so I'm going to read this for you. I want to start here. So there was this guy, Hananiah, this false prophet called Hananiah in, in Jeremiah 28. And Hananiah was telling them, hey, you know what? God says everything's okay. Here it is. Actually, here it is. Let me just read it. Uh, so Hananiah said to the men in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all people. So it's like this guy comes to church, for example. This is what the Lord told me. I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will break... Uh, bring back to this place all the articles of the Lord's house of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Na Babylon, removed from here and took to Babylon. And I will also bring back to the place of Jehoiakim, Je 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 son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, hard names, all the other exiles from Judah who, Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Here it is. Babylon, uh, remember Jeremiah is, uh, is d during the exile time. Um, so he's in Babylon. Uh, he's, this guy says, hey, don't worry. All these bad kings, especially in Persia, he's going to give back our nations. But the prophecy was 70 years, not two years. All right, 70 years. 
Well, he's sharing this like, hey, it's almost like how the church today are preaching this health and wealth. God never promised health and wealth if you follow him. I promise you that. Nowhere in the Bible promises that. Now, there are some that's going to get prosperity and some that are not. But he's pretty much saying, hey, you know what? Don't worry, guys. Two years, he's going to send us back. And all these kings, he's going to break his back. We're going to come back. Jeremiah, see, this is how you can tell a false prophet. If a prophet shared something that didn't come to true, we know he's a false prophet. And this is why the prophet Jeremiah comes out, and this is where I think, you know, this is where we talk about Jedi stuff. Listen to what happened. Then the prophet of Jeremiah replied to the prophet of Hanani before the priests of all the kings were standing in the house of the Lord. He said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words you have prophesied by bringing the articles of the Lord's house and all the exiles back to the place of Babylon. He's saying, Yeah, great. But, nevertheless, listen to what I have said to you in hearing, in the hearing of all the people. From early times of the prophets, all my other predecessors before me, who preceded you and me, have prophesied war, disaster, and plague against many countries and great kingdoms. But the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord, only if his prediction comes true. All right, he's, he's putting him to test. Fine. You say peace is coming? Let's test it out. Because everything else before me, everything else here in the Old Testament, says we got more problems coming. Then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah and broke it. And he said, For all the people, this is what the Lord says, In the same way I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, off the neck of all the nations within two years. At this the prophet Jer Jeremiah went on away. He, he said, You want to recant Hananiah? Because, you know, bro, I'm, I'm trying to tell you something. It ain't going to happen. You want to do it, then it, basically if it don't come true, you're going to get some bad things going to happen to you. And it's almost like our president. Well, no, I can't. Eh, some of you guys might be Democrats. All right. All the presidents promise stuff. No taxes. Yes, taxes. No taxes. And, you know, and people are always listening. But here it is. Hananiah says, you know, I confirm it. I make a bet with you. Two years. Peace. After the prophet Hananiah had broken the yoke off the neck of prophet. Oh, uh, wait. Did I read that? The, oh, the word. Yes. The, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Verse 13. Go and tell Hananiah. This is what the Lord says. You have broken a wooden yoke, but in this place you will get a yoke of iron, meaning you get a heavier yoke. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. I will put on an iron yoke on the necks of these nations to make them serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. They will serve him, and I will give him control over the wild animals. Meaning, God says, you, you follow this knucklehead, this false prophet. You keep following him, and this is what's happening. I'm not going to give you a wooden yoke. I'm going to give you a heavier yoke that's going to be on your back, and that you will serve this king, Nebuchadnezzar, because of all the bad things you've done in the past. Check this out. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah, the prophet, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, yet you have persuaded this nation in trusting lies. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I am about to remove you from the face of the earth. This very year you are going to die because you have preached a rebellion against the Lord. And in the seventh month of that same year, Hananiah, the prophet, died. Two things happened. Jeremiah was, remember I told you, his prophecy came true. Hananiah's prophecy did not come true. And you see these great, this is Jedi stuff, man. And you telling me this is not interesting? I know that we get caught up with, you know, all the literary devices. But man, prophets, they were action. People, people lose lives. So it's kind of like, you know, when you watch Star Wars, you don't cross a Jedi. Remember how uh, I think in Star Wars 1, the first movie, really the fourth movie, right? And they were breaking through this battleship, and they and they were like, you know, how many how many people are coming? They said two Jedi's, and everybody's like freaking out, like the whole battleship's like, oh my gosh, two Jedi's! We don't mess around with Jedi's. You don't mess around with prophets, right? So Jeremiah talks about judgment, and, and you just saw that was pretty much a summary of what happened. Now I want to move to uh, Lamentations really fast. Lamentations. Jeremiah was in Israel at the time when. King Nebuchadnezzar actually took over the rule and destroyed and plucked out the eyes of the king. And lamentation is when he laments. And he writes this beautiful short five chapter of basically not cursing God, but like, why God? And, and it sounds like he's yelling and screaming at God. And sometimes people, I know that's how we feel. When you're through the most roughest time, you basically saw his, his nation being picked apart. Children being raped and People being gouged out. His king killed right in front of him. Well, not killed, but um, humiliated right in front of him. And he writes, he pens it. His emotions just coming out on the pages. Just in tears, and he's lamenting. But if you notice, it, it's a it's a 
it's kind of like an uphill battle. He's laments about the falls of Earth and then the wrath of God. And then, but in chapter 3, it turns and he says, you know, but I know you're grateful and you're gracious, God. And in the middle of the chapter, here's the climax of it. And, and Lamentations 3, 21, 23 is the climax. And we, we sing this song quite a bit in, um, in church. And if you haven't heard the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, it comes from here. And let me go ahead and open that for you. But in the middle of the, the five chapters, at the climax, he realizes that, God, you still love us. You still care for your people. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. See, for us who are suffering and who is going through a lot of pain right now, we have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And he's talking about an analogy of like in the morning, hope comes. And you know, new things come in the morning. And, and we have to repent the sins of all the types of people. We need to repent. And we pray for our future. We have a hope for the future because God is gracious. And even though, like Boaz and Ruth, we, we talk about how chapter 2, uh, 1, ends in just sorrow. Chapter 2 has a glimmer of hope. And, and Ruth finds out that the hope is in this Redeemer, Boaz. And for us, the Redeemer is Jesus Christ. And so here Isaiah lament, I mean Jeremiah laments, and it's a great uh, passage on that. And, and we move to Ezekiel. We're zooming through the Old Testament. I've never done this this fast before, but Ezekiel is... Um, He's a crazy kind of guy, but <laughs> the outline is very simple. Uh, let you look at that. You can pause it. But um, Ezekiel, probably one of the most popular passages, is chapter 37, the key chapter, the Valley of the Dry Bones. Dry Bones. Uh, Ezekiel, a prophet, and he is in the exile time, so he's not in Israel. He's over in Babylon area. Has this this dream one night, and he sees this valley of dead bones. Just thousands of bones dead. And he sees the breath of the Lord, which is the Spirit of the Lord. Breath and Spirit is the same thing. Coming in and breathing life into dry bones. And all of a sudden he sees bones kind of, like, it's kind of creepy, right? Raising up and flesh was being added onto it, but they were still zombie-ish. But then the Spirit of the Lord breathes air into it. And, and, and it talks about, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone of your, out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And so in the Valley of Dry Bones, he's doing this pictures, images, he's dreaming and, and reading life. And that's what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit does for us. When Jesus Christ comes into our heart, he breathes life into us. And basically it's the restoration of Israel. So remember, 70 years, they're in exile, they just got beaten the crap out of them. And they are just just destroyed morally, um, I'm sorry, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. God has left us. But he, Ezekiel is writing this restoration of Israel. And the key theme is, I'm going to breathe life into you. But Israel also is the church now today and how Christ breathes life into us and all of us who who, who have sinned against him and, and, and caused problems and, and, and he punishes us but you know what he has a plan to restore us and the big story is that God comes down and wants to restore us the little story the lower story where we are feeling pain and sorrow we've been beaten and all these things and we're like there is no hope but remember and so this is what Ezekiel is trying to do, and he shares this image of the Valley of the Dry Bones. Crazy stuff, these prophets, man. They're ex exciting, and so I, I find joy in it. And, of course, one of our favorite prophets, we come to the prophet Daniel. Now, we don't think of Daniel as a prophet. We think of him as this guy in the lion's den. In fact, I'm going to pull up this poll that my previous class had, and you can use, fill in your blank. I mean, I mean fill it in yourself. But the question I had asked them was, what do you think of when you think of Daniel? What comes to mind when you think of and remember the stories of Daniel? And, and most of them, when they typed out answers, you can text us in right now if you want. Lion's Den, he was a dreamer, he's a man of courage, but it was mostly Lion's Den, praying in the Lion's Den. Um, there was the furnace of the three boys, yes, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And so we think of that, but really the first six chapters of Daniel was the narrative, the story of all of these things that we talk about, but really the next five chapters was he talks about the prophecy, which we will find out in Revelations uh, in further detail. So when we talk about future end times, we go to the book of Daniel, chapter 7 through 12, and we think of Revelations. So I wanted to uh, talk to you about that, that's briefly, so that's a two-part outline, but Daniel Again, it's uh, sovereignty of God's men and the nation's meaning. With Daniel, he was one of this young guy, captive, 
in a, a nation. He did not know. They stripped of his name. They gave him a new name, Belshazzar. Why did people get new names back then? Because if I strip you of your name and I give you a new name in my country, you are basically, in essence, ripping my culture apart from me. Uh, my name is Kwa in Vietnamese, but it's Kevin in English. Not to say that I'm going to um, lose my culture, but every year I live in a new nation, it's going to slowly dissipate. And uh, by my fourth generation, my son will probably not be able to speak Vietnamese as well as me, and I'm not that good either because I'm second gen. But it's going to dissipate, and that's what nations did. They would take the best of the best and then import them to their nation, learn their culture, learn them, get their new names, and that's how they assimilated their culture into society. And Daniel was talking about how God was sovereign this whole time and that he was constantly watching over them. Even though they're not in the promised land of Israel, he's still watching over them. Beautiful story. And so I'm going to jump, um, skip two and three, jump to Daniel, and I'm going to come back to the fall of Israel when I talk about the minor prophets, which is in our next scene. But let's go ahead and watch Daniel in number 18. 
even though the Bible, I'm, and I chose to go in the order of the Bible, but I'm just, I'm jumping around right now in, in chron chronological order. In the Minor Prophets, most of it happened during the fall of North and the South, and so we're going to jump back to the messengers. But this was after everything had been destroyed, right? And so all the minor pro all these other prophets had already been ahead. Daniel's in the time of Babylon, and so just wanted to let you know that we are um, off a little bit, but that's because I wanted to finish up the section. And I guess the main section here is that whatever the situation, whatever the circumstances, God's still watching over his people. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to go walk through fire, or we're going to, you know, not challenge the government every time, but what I am saying is that being faithful to God, and these were all situations where they, they were being challenged through to worship. Daniel was being challenged to, to not pray to God, and the three friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Benedict, were, were told to worship a different God. And they stood up for their God. And God promises continue to be faithful to Him, and He will continue to be faithful to you. And that these are things that, uh, principles that we learn in life. So, uh, just want to continue on. You can feel free. You want to take a break anytime. Just take a break. Uh, push pause. But I need to go on and finish the next 12 minor prophets that we're going to zoom through. And uh, I just, like I said, Jedi or prophet? Who are these people? Uh, no, this is not Pulp Fiction. This is Samuel L. Jackson, Mace Windu. I, I, now, you guys can tell I love Star Wars. I love it. Anybody want to send me any Star Wars gifts, any Comic Cons, any Star Wars, uh, Star Trek conventions? I also, I'm, I'm sorry, Star Wars convention. I'm also a Star Trek fan too, but kind of a nerd I am. But I started loving the prophets when I started realizing these guys are prophets. Here's Prophet Hananiah, the bad false prophet. You guys know who he is, right? Yeah, that's Anakin, right? And then there's this Yoda guy, and, and we think that, because they had messages, but at the same time, they were powerful too. They had weapons. And uh, again, I don't want you to think prophets were these guys that clothes just walk around like old hermits, like wise sages. But they were active people. They were in the ministry. They were doing things. Elijah at Mount Carmel, uh, you guys talked about it. It was First Kings. Uh, the video was talking about how he was going, him versus 400 prophets. He was making fun of them. He was calling them out. He said, hey, my God can do this. And so, you know, he, it didn't look old to me and all wretched. And same thing with Jeremiah and Hananiah. So um, I think of Jedis when I think of prophets. Now, that's for you to think about. Um, and, of course, they were to retain the message. And so here's what uh, prophets did. Um, I'm sorry, the, uh, summarizing the messengers. So during the period of Israel's history, you had three major periods. Pre-exilic, meaning before Assyria and Babylon took control of the north and the south. You had the exilic time. There were 70 years. There was a prophecy that God says, hey, you know what? These people, uh, you will be exiled in Babylon and Assyria for 70 years, meaning you're not going to go home. And that's where Isaiah through Daniel were. So pre-exilic is mostly Joshua through Second Chronicles and the wisdom literature and most prophets, which we're going to hit up on. So Daniel was the, in the exilic period, and that was when they started returning. When they returned, last week we talked about Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. That's post-exilic, where they return back to their homeland in Israel and re start rebuilding again. And you had a few minor prophets in the Bible, Malachi was being the last one, that was speaking during that time. So God sends messengers, and of course the final prophet, the major prophet, uh, the prophet of prophet, the chief prophet, is Jesus Christ. No other prophets after Jesus Christ. They pretty much had three messages I share about. It's repentance. Turn away, turn towards me. Warnings and judgment. Did I misspell judgment? I think I did. Judge. Uh, the day of the Lord. There is some time in the future... And there are, I guess, judgments now that we suffer consequences, but the final judgment is this day of the Lord that it talks about. You will continually hear this theme, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And that's the day when all knees will bow and all tongues will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe that there will be a time when Jesus Christ will return again and everybody will be accountable for what they have done. But the most important thing is not about workspace. It's about have you put your faith in the Lord God Almighty? And have you put your faith in the Lord God Almighty, the one who saves and created us, Jesus Christ? And that is where um, here at Cal Baptist, we firmly believe that. And I want to give you every rationale through the scripture here that the story is always about the Son, Jesus Christ. 
who is God and and demands our praise, demands our worship. And uh, the key thing is not out of what we like, de- as in like no choice, but it's we were created to worship. We were designed to be worshiping Him, and we are most happy, most joyful when we do that. And so that's it. But pretty much, repentance, warning, and judgment are the three major messages of the uh, minor prophets, uh, of all the prophets. Um, here I want to do something. Uh, I'm going to share the video, the north and the south. So remember the fall of Israel came first, of uh, the north. And that came in 722 B.C. Then the south died in 586 B.C. And that's when Isaiah penned, Jeremiah penned all their stuff. Um, I'm going to show these two videos consecutively, and then I'm going to finish up uh, the next 10 to 15 minutes of these minor prophets. I'm going to summarize most of them. But let me go ahead and show you these to give you an idea of how the north fell and how the south fell. So that will be video 16 and 17. So we'll be back to back. Play would be nice. In the northern kingdom, Israel, the people continued to turn their backs on God. So God allowed them to be taken prisoner by the nearby country of Assyria. Meanwhile, in the southern kingdom, Judah, there was a new king named Hezekiah, who was only 25 years old. Hezekiah followed God's ways, removing the idols to false gods. God helped him be successful in all he did. The king of Assyria, who had recently taken over Israel, sent one of his commanders to threaten Hezekiah, telling him that God would not protect Judah from Assyria's attack. So Hezekiah went to a prophet named Isaiah for help. Isaiah was a man who God had spoken through many times. Isaiah assured Hezekiah that God would help them defeat the Assyrians. Late that night, the angel of the Lord went through the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 people. The next morning, the remaining Assyrians retreated, terrified. Soon after, Isaiah reminded the Israelites that they were to follow God in all they did. But the people turned away from God again and again, and things continued to get worse for them as a nation. Despite their disobedience, God delivered a promise through Isaiah that a new king and a new kingdom was coming for the Israelites. Isaiah spoke of a man who would one day be rejected by those around him and suffer a terrible death. But somehow, through his death, this man would bring peace and a kingdom that would never end. And then we have our next one, the fall of the south. So Isaiah was talking to the north, now we have the south. King Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, was only 12 years old when he became king. He was very different from his father, doing all sorts of evil things. He led the people to worship false gods. Things got so bad that God brought the Assyrian army against Manasseh. They put a hook in his nose and led him away to the city of Babylon as a prisoner. In his suffering, Manasseh humbled himself and prayed to God. God allowed Manasseh to be set free and return home. For a few years, things began to improve, and the Israelites began to follow God again. They even discovered the book containing all of the laws of Moses, which had been lost for many years. The people learned once again what it was like to live in God's way. But soon, things got much, much worse. The kings who ruled over Judah once again led the people away from God. Then one day, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, attacked the Israelites, nearly destroying the temple Solomon had built. He captured almost all of the Israelites, including the best warriors, workers, and artists, and sent them to Babylon. Only a few of the poorest Israelites were allowed to stay to take care of the fields. God sent two prophets, 
Jeremiah to those left in Jerusalem, and Ezekiel to those living in Babylon. Unfortunately, the news was bad. Because they had done so much evil, God allowed the city of Jerusalem, their home, to be almost completely destroyed, and the rest of the Israelites sent to Babylon. But the prophet Ezekiel told the Israelites living in Babylon that God would not forget about them, that God would one day rescue and restore them. God even gave Ezekiel a vision that he was standing in a valley full of bones. There was a rattling sound, and the bones began to come together, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and they came to life. God told Ezekiel the meaning of the vision. These bones are the whole house of Israel. I am going to open your grave and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am God. So God continues to be faithful to his people, although the people are not faithful to him. But he continues to carry that promise. Remember the promise that started the seed of his, uh, the seed that he promises in in Genesis, after the fall of man and, and the fall of yeah, man, the sin, in Genesis 3, he promises the woman that there will be a seed that I'm going to continue watching over you, even though you're going to have these trials and things that you made some consequences and disobedience. I'm still going to be faithful. And again, when you're talking about that's the natural character of God. And so that goes us to the first minor prophet in Hosea. And this Hosea book, oh man, talk about loyalty and love. This is about a prophet named Hosea, God tells him to go and get marry a, uh, we, we can't for sure say, but basically an unfaithful woman. We're thinking she's a whore, a prostitute. And so in the Bible, this is a book of whoredom. I know, I said whoredom in Bible class, but it is. Go marry a whore and name your kids, uh, I think it was like, you know, trouble and disaster, some crazy stuff he named his kids. And, and so in Hosea, the concept here is that I want you to know how it feels like. And so she's going to cheat on you. And she does in chapter 2 and in chapter 3. And then he, and I think in chapter 4, I'm sorry, 3, he says, I want you to go back and marry her again and buy her back. And so what happens is he marries her knowing that she has a pattern of unfaithfulness. She is unfaithful. And then in chapter 3, he goes back and says, I want you to buy her back. So that's why we think it's a, a prostitute. But to buy her back. And I want you to realize this is how I feel. And so this is not make-believe. This is what it is. And so, of course, Hosea is being taught to love this woman unconditionally and continue to have hope and, 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 and trust that this relationship will stay intact. And so um, it's very tough, especially in the book of Hosea. And, of course, after that, he starts following the prophecies of how there's going to be some issues that, you know, of course, the judgment, that's going to happen. But... Um, as you go through the minor prophets, and I'm just going to skip through these slides. Joel is the day of the Lord. It's about the locusts. Um, and it, it, he's going to send locusts from the north. And usually Israel, you get attacked from the north because the desert's to the what east of it. So you have to come from the north to attack it. And you're going to send these waves of locusts. And, uh, and in reality, it's the Assyrian army. So the locusts represent the Assyrian army. But the locusts are these type of creatures. I, I, can I find a picture? Maybe I should find a picture. What does a locust look like? Anybody know what a locust looks like? Uh, Google is amazing, isn't it? You just go type locust. I click on images. And you have some crazy locusts. Uh, no, that's a burrito, huh? Oh, is that a locust taco? Get out of here! Anyways. Like a big grasshopper. That's a bad picture. Too small. Uh, let's go look at it. Here. Zoom up. Hopefully this zooms up. A locust eats everything in its path. It's ugly, I think it is. And uh, it eats everything in its path, and it devours. And pretty much when you have a locust like attack, um, it eats all the vegetation. The vegetation can't grow back. It eats not just the leaves, but the stem. So if you eat the leaves, it can grow back, but it eats everything. And so these locusts come, and it represents the Day of the Lord. And again, the Day of the Lord is, it is a purification almost, in a sense that it is purifying. And so what happens is when it eats all this, people will die. And so, but there is this one section in, in chapter 2 and 3 it talks about that the Lord will restore back to his people the years that have been taken away. And I want to pause here for those of you who are going through some struggles. And this is the, the message here. 
even though I'm telling this big story, an historical story, I wanted to tell you the story applies because the implication is this. There are locuses in our lives that eat at us. And it just takes away. It could be cancer. It could be a lost marriage. It could be someone who has broken from a hard relationship. And you feel like these years have been wasted. You feel like the weight of things that are on you have been taken away from you. And you don't know why. And I think that's what we study Ruth and the same thing that Dr. Platt preached. It's just you feel like you've wasted years of time. But it says in the passage in, in, J, in, in, in Joel that God will restore those years. If you continue to be faithful to Him, He will restore those years back to you. And you will find a new sense of joy. And uh, that is joy of salvation. And so Joel goes like that. Amos, judgment of Israel. I'm just kind of going through it. Amos and Ob Obadiah. Oops, I just missed it. Um, Obadiah is to these different nations. So as you go through these verses, I'm going to leave these slides. Jonah, one of our favorite stories, in the big belly of the, not a whale, but a big fish. Talks about um, uh, four chapters, very short. And judgment on Nineveh. God sends Jonah to Nineveh. Did not want to go there. Nineveh is like Vegas, a place of sin. We, wh what happens in Nineveh stays in Nineveh. And Jonah's like this holier than thou prophet. Says, I don't want anything to do with that nation. But God continues to say, I love this nation. I created them. How dare you? Who are you to, to have a monopoly on religion, uh, on what I say? And God tells Jonah, you will go. And you will teach about re repentance. And they will repent. Jonah goes reluctantly. He didn't think that they were going to repent. But they ended up repenting. They fasted and they repented. The whole nation of Nineveh. This is one of the biggest evangelistic moments ever. When you talk about Billy Graham Crusades, this is the whole city to faith and God continues to say I will spare who I want to spare and so God sends a message and, and Jonah is sitting here from the top of the mountaintop and he's looking down over the city and it was really hot that one day, the last chapter and God causes a, a vine to grow and this vine grows over Jonah, it's this wonderful shade and he's sleeping, he's just waiting, he's thinking there's a nuclear holocaust, I want to have the best seat in the house, I'm eating popcorn and God's going to destroy you, but then they repented and Jonah was angry and he sleeps bitter and God sends a worm to eat the vine and the vine decays and, and, and withers away and then it's hot and Jonah's like God come on man like, give me the shade back and God says I grew that vine and I can take that vine away it's my vine you're just enjoying the shade because of my grace Nineveh is my city my people and I choose Give grace or not to give grace. I'm the judge. And Jonah learns a story, and as we all learn the story, that um, we go where God asks us to go. So salvation is not only for Jewish people, but to Gentiles, non Jewish people. That's you and me, unless there's someone Jewish in this class. But salvation is for all, everyone. Bad, good, we're all bad, no one's good. Um, uh, lineage, no lineage, rich, poor, it's for everyone. And God's desire is to have everyone come to know him, the creator. And then we go through Micah, and we go through these different books, Zephaniah, you know, uh, Habakkuk, a great book, Haggai, he rebuilds the temple, Zechariah, and then we hit Malachi. And let me hit what Malachi here is. Malachi, important, the last prophet of the book. It appeals to backsliders. Now, I don't, I don't know wherever you stand in this class, but there are people out there that came to Christ at a, a young age and and they, uh, they kind of fell away a little bit. Well, it talks about restoring your faith with God and, and come back. I love you. Come back. Come back. And that's a nice little end to it. But at the end of it, um, there's this key verse that I want you to talk to you about. There's a reminder of his prophet of coming. You see, this is the last book of the Old Testament. There's, you want to know that there's something. There's going to be connecting to the New Testament. And here's how we connect. Because this is 500 years later that Christ comes to the scene. But here it is. You have wearied the Lord with your words. You, you say, yet you say, what, you have, what have we caused grief on you? What, what's the problem, God? I mean, come on. Well, in that you say, everyone who does is good does good in the sight of the Lord, and he will delight in them. Where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger, a prophet. Messenger is prophet, right? And he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord.
of hosts. Hey, there will be a person who comes, and he will judge, and he will rule, and he is coming. And behold, I will send you Elijah, the old prophet, before the coming of the great and the dreadful day of the Lord. There is some judgment coming. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike them. Earth will be a curse. People will look at each other and they will say, Who is this? What's going on here? There is someone more special than Elijah, more special than all these prophets that have uh, preceding us. And it will be that time. And it will be. The key chapter is chapter 3, and it says that there will be this prophet, John the Baptist. It doesn't particularly say, but I will send a messenger before him who will lay the way, and that is Jesus Christ. And so you will see this, these themes starting to come out. And I want you to know this was 500 years before Jesus Christ. So people ask me, hey, how do you know the Bible is true, man? There is prophecy that comes true. Remember I told you a false prophet is the one that things don't come true. Well, all the prophecies in the Old Testament are starting to come true in the New Testament. And you will see that connection piece as this one story ties together. And I'm going to share with you later uh, the next session about what's happening in the five years of silence. We're going to come back to this slide. 500 years of silence. Uh, what happens in the world is Greece is coming to power. Uh, all the Middle Eastern countries are coming apart. Alexander kind of unites everything. And so you have a Greco feel. Rome is, uh, when Jesus is there, Rome is the superpower. But you have Greece culture, Grecian culture. And of course, Christ comes to the scene. And that's where we're going to start in unit three. Okay? Old Testament done. Chapter, uh, we are done with four weeks. Halfway point. Guys, I want to continue to encourage you to to stay strong, stay firm. We're almost home. We've got a couple more assignments. I know it moves very quickly, but here's our assignments for week four. Get a TV show. You can go to Hulu.com. You can watch Simpsons. You can watch Bones. Smallville. 24 is one of my favorites. Anything current. We're, we're looking for a two-page reflection of what are the biblical themes that keep popping up, if any, or if, it, if biblical themes that are not popping up. These are things that are counter. Um, there's some pretty... Uh, controversial shows out there. I want you to stay, you know, stay clean. Something that, you know, you'd let my two-year-old son watch, maybe. But, you know, these are some suggestions. Uh, and then in two weeks, the Bartholomew and Goween book review is due, and so that's four and a half pages. But just want to get these assignments. Get caught up. I know you guys, are, some of you guys are turning in some things a little late, but just get caught up. But I want to say blessing to you all. Thank you very much. We're going to come back um, to the New Testament when we rejoin next week. Look for us on the Blackboard discussion board. Let's get some conversation going. And uh, I thank you for our time today. All right. Have a great week. Bye.